Tonight's guest is Shadow Harshaw. Shadow, welcome to the show. Hello, Vic. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate your time. Shadow, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Okay, well, I have been born and raised in the uh, southeastern part of Oklahoma my whole life. Did all my schooling here. Did my college here. The only time I've really left the state is small vacations, stuff like that. I am 25. I have been in the corrections work field since 2017, especially one of the only job fields I've known. I've had a few odd and end jobs here and there, but corrections is one of the main things I've done. I uh, am currently with the state. I really enjoy it. I have taken a break in between to get one of my college degrees. I'm really excited about, you know, I worked hard for that and uh, I like to hunt when I can. I love to fish when I can. I love to play basketball with my friends. You know, I like to spend time with my little ones. I live a really laid back lifestyle. I work, you know, I spend time with my family and then I do the best I can when I have a little bit of free time. Well, there's nothing wrong with that at all. You just mentioned hunting and fishing. What are your woods credentials? Oh, I, uh, I was in the scouts my whole life. My grandpa is 79. He still goes out and hunts every year. When it comes to woods credentials, as far as some of your other guests, I'm, you know, I'm still young, so I don't have the crazy credentials, but I have spent a lot of time in the woods. I mean, when we go in the woods, we don't go out there for a couple hours. We go to stay for several days. I mean, that's one of the things you don't just, my family, the way we do it is you don't just go to just go hunt something. You go to enjoy nature. You go to enjoy everything, be a part of it. I mean, because you're not just going out there to take a life of an animal or do something like that. You're going out there to just get back to God's country, you know, get away from the smog of the city, get away from the cell phones for a little bit. That's why when I go hunting, even if I don't get anything, I'm just excited because I was out there for a few days. I was away from everything when it's just beautiful. And it's just perfect. I've been in the woods my whole life since about four years old. Yeah, you have spent a lot of time out there then. And speaking of that, what are the encounters you're going to tell us about tonight down to your interest in going back out into the woods? Well, my encounters happened in, in the middle of 2018, then right there during deer season 2018. So one happened in August and the next one happened in November. And I didn't go back into the woods from November 2018 till probably, I would say, probably deer season 2020 and you know i harvested a really beautiful deer in 2020 and um, my family and friends got to eat well but it took a little while to go back in the woods because stuff like that just puts what i call get right in you and you just when you walk around the woods with a gun and stuff you think that you know you're high and mighty but Moments like that really bring you back down to earth and you realize, well, maybe I'm not the biggest thing out here. And it just kind of, I'm not a scaredy cat person. Corrections and stuff kind of gives you a harder mindset, but something like that, it took me a little bit to, you know, it took all of us a little bit to kind of get to where we wanted to go back comfortably. I mean, we would still go to the cabin, you know, and go play video games and cards and stuff like that. But as far as like actual, tromping around the woods that took almost two years but i still go regularly now we just went last weekend had a good time well that's great i'm so glad to hear that you're able to go back in like that what was the tipping point in 2020 that made you go back into the woods was there something that happened oh just my best friend he's really good at juicing me he was the one i had the encounters with and his encounters was just as crazy as mine and he just said, you know, it's it's time. I had been working a lot, too, though. So it wasn't just that, you know, I was nervous of the woods. I've been busy because when you work in corrections, like currently right now, do the short staffing, I'm working five and six, 12-hour shifts a week with one to two days off. It can be really tough, but deer season, he's like, it's time. He's like, you have time saved up. We're going to go to deer camp. We're going to have a good week. We're going to get a deer. And everything's going to be perfect. And I was like, you know what? You're right. 
I've been working my tail off. It's time to get back in the woods. Let's go. And that's what got me back. And now that I'm back, I can't stay out. Well, that's great. As much as you love being out there, it really would be a shame if you couldn't go back. So I'm glad to hear that. Speaking of that friend, you said he was with you when you had that first encounter. When things go south, Shadow, are you lucky to have him around? Or would you say that he's lucky to have you around? (laughs) Oh, Vic. That's a whole nother podcast in itself. Me and that man have been best friends since we were in third grade. I have actually called a job and quit for him because he couldn't make the phone call. We can't do one thing without the other. I mean, some of the craziest stuff that's ever happened in our lives. We have been side by side from car wrecks to crazy nights, fights, all that stuff. I mean, if there's one person, he will tell, he'll say the same thing. I'll tell you that. I couldn't do it without him by my side. and He couldn't do it without me by my side. And it's crazy because we look like polar opposites. You know, he's 6'3 and athletic. And then you got me. I'm 5'7", chunky, about as goofy as it comes. But, man, I couldn't have went through that without him. I'll tell you that. He sounds like a keeper to me. He sounds like a good guy. From what I understand, the Jack Fork Mountains in Oklahoma, where you had your first encounter, has got a reputation for being a creepy place. What more can you tell us about that? Okay, so the Jack Fork Mountains are just south of a little town called Hartshorn. And then if you follow them through to the east, you know, you can end up going all the way to Tallahanna and Clayton. It's a massive area. Now, I don't know no complete truths, but there's a lot of myths about the Jack Fork Mountains. There was one myth that in the 80s, a helicopter was shot down going over it. I mean, the Jack Fork Mountains are very notorious. If you go in with your business, you don't go in with anybody else's business in mind. You keep to yourself, you do what you want to do, and you leave everybody the heck alone. You do not go in there looking for trouble. Yeah, it does sound like kind of a near place. Before we move on, if you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, either way is fine. Please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. Also, you should know I've got a new Bigfoot show I'm producing. It's called My Bigfoot Sighting, and I put a link for it in the description for tonight's show. You really should check it out. If you listen, you'll see that it's a different kind of Bigfoot show, and I think you'll like it. All right, Shadow, please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay, well, where this encounter happened, my best friend, his family owns a little farm on about 200 acres out in the Jack Fort Mountains. And to give you a little bit of setting of this place, it is so far to get out there and so far away from civilization, you have to drive 26 miles down a dirt road going no faster than 24, 25 miles an hour. It's just a nasty, scraggly dirt road. When it rains, it's washed out. And it's the prototypical journey. I mean, because when you get in the vehicle and you leave from the house to go there, you know you're going on a journey. Because, I mean, you're just going through woods and woods, and it's just awesome. And then when you get to the farm, there's a cabin on this little hill, and it's a tiny cabin. It's got electricity, and that's where, you know, we set up at. And it's fenced in. It's got what we call the barn to the left of it. It's got the hog pasture to the right of the barn, and then the whole land just takes off. Well, my first encounter happened, at, like I said, in August, and it happened roughly at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's what makes my encounter, in my opinion, so crazy, is that it was broad daylight. My friend and I were prepping for some early deer season stuff, and we were setting up feeders, deer cams, stuff like that, putting corn out in different spots, getting some tree stands hung up, stuff like that. And we had just set up a feeder on where we call the field. The field is roughly a mile and a half to the left of the cabin on a downward slope. That's where we do a lot of the hunting. There's a lot of different trails that stem from the field. They go down to a a giant creek bed. They go back up to another area. In a smaller field, they go over and around to a shell pond. Then go all the way back up around to the cabin. 
there's multiple different routes, but the field is kind of the hub of where we start our hunts at. Well, anyway, we're setting up this deer feeder, and I, I usually carry what my friend calls the heavy artillery. I usually carry, you know, 12 gauge shotguns or a 308 rifle or 4570 rifle. I usually carry really big weapons along with a 45 handgun. Well, all that just happened to be in the truck. And the only thing we had is my friend, he had a little 20 gauge shotgun and it had bird shot in it. And as you know, everybody knows bird shot is not meant for anything bigger than birds or small animals. But as we set up the deer feeder, he goes, Hey, Shadow, why don't we take the long way back to the truck? Because at that moment, we were probably 100 yards from the truck. He said, Why don't we go through that giant cleared out ravine, which used to be a river, and you follow it all the way back? And you'll circle, it's almost a thousand yards, and it twists and it turns and it winds. And it will come back right by the truck. He said, let's go through there and maybe we can find a rabbit or a squirrel and we can use that as coyote bait. And to my viewers that are sensitive, I apologize, but, you know, in southeastern Oklahoma, coyote hunting is a big deal. They have tournaments. It's, it's what we do. And if we use smaller animals as bait to hunt the coyotes. And I said, okay, that sounds like a good idea. And without thinking, you know, I didn't think to go back to the truck and grab my 4570 or my 308 AR-10. I didn't think to do that. You know, I said, okay, I'm just going to go for this nice little nature walk. He's got the 20 gauge because that's what you need to shoot a small animal. You don't need nothing big. So we start walking and we get down this ravine and to kind of paint a picture, picture yourself and an old dried out creek bed with about two feet on the right and two feet on the left kind of up. That's why, how you would walk up into the woods on each side. And the woods on each side are thick. I'm talking thick, thick jungle, prototypical forest foliage. I mean, you couldn't see two, three feet in the woods if you wanted to. The only thing you can see is the daylight that comes straight down. You can see the sun that comes straight down into the creek bed. If not for that, if the trees would have grown over, it would have been pitch black. So we were walking. And like I said, this ravine is probably a good thousand yards from where we were at back to the truck. It's a pretty good little trek. And we probably walked, I don't know, three, four, five hundred yards. And we start hearing something. And I'm standing on the left and Jason is to my right. And it's about that time, as I said, we start hearing something. And if you're in the woods a whole lot, you can hear all kinds of stuff and you start to distinguish stuff. But this right here was one of the most interesting noises I've ever heard. It was heavy. And it wasn't your prototypical deer or, or pig or whatever it was. It was walking and it was heavy. And as most hunters know, when you walk through the woods, even animals, they walk carefully, not to disturb their prey, or if they are prey, not to be hunted. Nothing's going to walk through the woods trying to make noise. But this thing didn't care. It was heavy, and it was walking like it owned the land. And my friend looks over to me, and he goes, do you hear that? And I go, yeah. He goes, is it on two legs? And I go, well, it really sounds like it, doesn't it? He goes, that is crazy. And obviously, I'm talking a little louder than we did. I mean, we were whispering, and we were just kind of in shock. It was probably, I would say, a good 20 feet behind us, and probably probably just right there, right there at the edge of the creek bed, about 20 feet back, but in the woods. And it was, it, like I said, it was just walking so heavily. I'll never forget that. It was just thromping, like just a happy-go-lucky kid just going to the candy shop. It was just cruising through there. And it followed us probably a good 200 yards. And then that is when it just shot from right behind us 
to probably 15 feet right in front of us. And we stopped because we heard it. And that's when it stepped out. And it stepped down off the left side of the creek bed. And it came down and it walked almost dead even with my friend and I. And it cocked and it turned its head and it kind of looked at him. And it cocked and it kind of turned its head back the other way and it kind of looked at me and kind of straightened its head and it kind of, kind of like it was baring its teeth. And I didn't see it bearing its teeth as a sign of aggression. It looked like it was trying to smile almost like, hey, yeah, that's right, you idiots. I'm here. I'm real. And we're just staring at this thing. And I got a good look at it because it's it stood there for every bit of 40 seconds to a minute. And it could have been shorter. It could have been longer. But when you're looking at something like that, time stands still. And I looked at it and it, and it and it stood up on haunches. I looked it right in the eyes and its eyes didn't glow. It had really normal eyes. They were yellow, but they didn't glow. But the one thing I'll never forget were the ears. The ears just stuck straight up. And they kind of twitched. And then as you look back down its body, you know, it's hairy. It's covered in hair and you got the snout that stuck out and then the hands. It had real hands. It didn't have just claws. It had five finger hands with long claw nails on the end of it. And it, it was just, you hear stuff and you see movies and you hear stories and you're just like, oh, well, that, that, well, this was, this was right in front of us. And it was very realistic looking. It was it was probably my friend is six three, and it was a little taller than him, so it was probably at least it was at least six four, and it could have been as tall as six 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 seven, and it was real healthy. It probably weighed a good two seventy, and it just stared. It didn't make no weird growling noises or anything. It just kind of looked at us, breathing. And then almost as if nothing, it just turned almost kind of like a military style to the left. And it walked right back up into the right side over to my friend's side now. And before I could say, did you see that? He cocked his shotgun. (laughs) And as we all know, a 20 gauge would do nothing but tick this critter off. But my friend was just, you know, he was doing what anybody would do. Show a force. This is my land. I'm the boss around here. Because you can't be scared in those situations. And that's one thing that we were trained. I can't say trained because we have no real experience. But we were raised by our parents and family to do is when it gets when the going gets tough, you got to You got to You got to act like you want to be there. You got to You can't be scared. You can't back down because if you show fear, it's over. It's got you. Were we both terrified? I will never lie. We were we were scared to death. I mean, if I'd have been drinking a lot of water, I might have used the restroom on myself. But it was just one of them deals where you just had to stand strong and you knew that no matter what happened, we were there, we had each other, we was gonna try to find a way out. So we walked and we just kept going down the trail. We knew that we were close. We were within four to five hundred yards of the truck, and we knew that if we just kept walking. We didn't panic. We didn't scream. We didn't run. We didn't shoot. That we could probably get back to the truck. And this thing walked right beside us. No farther than five to six feet away from. You could barely, you couldn't really see it, but you could tell it was there. You could kind of see a little bit because the foliage was so thick, but it was there. And it just walked right beside us the whole time. You talk about you talk about fear, knowing that that thing is just right there and it's just feet away from your buddy. And heck, that thing's arms probably could have made up the distance of a couple feet. So I think they just reached out and snagged him. And it was just 
like I said earlier, it's one of them put some get right kind of moments in you. You just know that you're not you're not as powerful as you think you was. Especially at the time, you know, 2018, three years ago, two 23-year-old kids. I mean, yeah, you've been able to drink for a couple of years, but you're still young. You ain't seen a whole lot of life yet. And that's that's just right there. That's life right in front of you. That's one of the moments that will change everything, the way you look at everything for the rest of your life. And as we go, we get back to the truck and we can see the truck. We're close. We're within we're within 50 yards of the truck. And I know, you know, always been more athletic. But he looked at me and he said, listen, I'm going to hold this thing off. You go to that truck. You take off as fast as you can. He said, you get one of them guns. He said, you turn around. And you get it off me. He said, if it's killing me, shoot me and then get it. And I was just at that moment, everything just hit me. It was real. It was all real at that moment. And he turned around and I just took off as fast as I could. I'll be honest with you. I don't got the longest legs. and I'm not the fastest runner, but I, I ran and I grabbed. As soon as I got that truck, I reached that window and I grabbed the AR-10. And I pulled the action on it in mid-turn as I turned around. Nothing. He's just standing there holding that gun, looking into the woods. Nothing came after him, anything. It was it was crazy. You know, I was, as you're running, all them scenarios play in your mind. And, you know, you just, you think of your buddy getting mauled by something right out of Hollywood and it terrifies you. What do you do if something like that happens? Is this is this gun I have? Is it going to be able to? Is it going to be able to kill it? Can this thing die? Everything just analytical goes through your mind a million miles an hour. But I go up there, I point the weapon down range, and we go back slowly. We get to the truck, and we get to the truck, and we go out, and we drive back around to the cabin. Well, we take the main road back out to the cabin, so it's about a a two-and-a-half-mile drive. And we're sitting there in silence for a little bit, just pure silence. And, you know, I'm the goofy one. I'm really goofy. I can't take nothing serious. I work in corrections, and I can't be serious. But I was quiet. He was quiet. And he's very stern. He's very serious. And out of nowhere, he breaks the silence first. He goes, Shadow, was that a werewolf? And I kind of chuckled, you know, because it's my job. That's what I am. I'm the I'm the icebreaker. I got I gotta set the tone. I gotta make everything funny again. But I couldn't. I just it was just kind of a nervous laugh. And I said, Well, it sure as heck looked like one, didn't it? And uh, he goes, well, Werewolves ain't real. I said, well, no, they're not. And he said, well, what's that? I said, buddy, this is Jack Fort Mountains. There's no telling what's been left alone out here. And that's when he said, well, let's kill it. And I said, what? He said, we've hunted everything there is out here. He said, this is our land. This is where we spend our time. Nothing like that's going to come out here and scare us off. He said, let's take it down. And I said, I don't even know if that thing can be taken down. He said, well, we'll call our two other buddies. We'll tell them we saw a bear. We'll get them out here. And we'll go find it. <laughs> and I said, I just, at that moment, I just, I was still in shock. And there was two things that was wrong with this plan. First of all, we had to kind of not lie, but, you know, goof to our two friends to get them out there, which once they got out there, we told them the absolute truth. The other problem with the plan was he wanted to hunt this thing at night because it was, you know, it was going to be dark decently soon. 
and it would take them almost two hours to get out there. Now, when you're 23 year old kids, once the fear goes away and the adrenaline starts going, you know, as they say, young, dumb, and full of, you know what, you start getting excited. You're like, okay, this is our time, go time. We're in this. We can't be messed with. We're going to show us what's boss. But it's dark. Something like this has probably lived in the woods its whole life. And I imagine it probably sees pretty well at nighttime. Well, believe it or not, us humans, we don't see the best in the dark unless we have lights. And we can't light up every single area (laughs) at once. So I just, I knew something was going to go crazy. But once our two friends got out there, we told them. We told them straight up everything. And one of them was a little skeptical, but the other one looked at me. and He stared. He had the most knowing eyes I've ever seen. And you talk about Hunter. He is the definition of a hunter. He has traveled the United States hunting. And he's my age. But he went all over. He's been in hunting competitions. He's been in archery competitions, rifle competitions. And he just looked at me. And at that moment, I knew he's seen something like this before. Because he didn't doubt a word we said. And as we were gearing up, you know, we got the Can-Am ready, which if people don't know what a Can-Am is, it's a UTV, kind of like a big four-wheeler. That you know holds more people, has a top on it, drives a little better. We had got some bigger guns and had switched to a 4570. It's a very, very powerful round at a shorter distance. It's a rifle shell, but it's a very, very it's a powerhouse at short distances. You ain't gonna reach out and touch nothing with it. But a hundred yards in, I mean. You should see what it would do to a deer. It's a powerful shell. And I had a 4570. And my buddy had taken my AR-10, which was a 308 round. It was a very, very powerful shell. Good stopping power. My other two friends had a 30 6 And the hunter, he had a 4570 as well. Well, as we're getting ready to get on the Can-Am, the sun was already going down. And that's where on the field in the distance, we start hearing coyotes. And usually, you know, you hear the coyotes when they're hunting rabbits or when they're being crazy or whatever they're doing, you know, playing cards. I don't know what coyotes do all the time, but they were, it was insane because they were in a fight with something and they were losing. I mean, it just, it was just the most Lord awful screams. And we just got in the Can Am and we sped down there. But once we get down there, you just you can't really see anything because the sun's starting to go down and it's just barely peaking. But we start spotlighting. And there was just probably five, six, seven coyotes. And they were just the only appropriate term for this is slaughtered. They were slaughtered. They were torn in pieces. I don't know what they made mad, but they were tore up. One looked like it had jumped and something caught it in midair and accordioned it. (laughs) And it was just, that sight was nuts. It's absolute nuts. Well, we get in the Can-Am, we start taking some of them trails. And we're spotlighting these trails, we're lighting them up, looking in the trees and stuff. And the whole time, you just have this feeling. I'm a firm believer. I'm not superstitious. But I'm a firm believer that every creature has a sense that allows it to know that something's watching on my, f- I feel like we have it as humans. I feel like that's why you set up in the middle of the night. I feel like, you know, if someone's staring at you or something is staring at you. And that whole time that we rode around, 
I felt that. I felt like something was watching us. Like I just, I just, there's a certain moment when you just know that the hunter is no longer hunting, but being hunted. And that's the feeling I had. But the craziest part of this is when we turned back and we got back to the field, every one of those bodies was gone. There was not one dead coyote anywhere, just spots of blood. Maybe an entrail here or there. Other than that, nothing. And that was the end of that one. We went back up to the cabin. We packed up. We went back to town. And we kind of debriefed. And they didn't see it, but they saw them coyotes. But my buddy and I, we saw what we saw. And we didn't think nothing of it. You know, we were obviously scared, but we were still, you know, just we're going to try going a merry way. Well, November rocks around, and it's the first. It's getting ready to be the first day of deer season with rifles. And he calls me up. He says, you want to go out there? You want to go hunt deer? Because his Jack Ford has some great deer. And I go, yeah, let's go. And we go out there the day before so we can play video games. And then we're already there and we get up the next morning and we hunt. And we in November, it gets dark earlier. And it was probably, I would say, 20, 30 minutes before good darkness. I had to use the restroom. Well, the cabin does not have running water. So you have to go outside to use the restroom. Well, I go to the right side of the cabin to use the restroom. And as I'm using the restroom, I'm finishing up and I look up and I look across the hog pasture. And sure as heck, right there at the edge of the hog pasture, standing there in the woods, this creature. And it was staring me down. First of all, that was awkward, you know, using the restroom, knowing that thing was staring at you. Talk about feeling vulnerable. But the crazy thing about it is, is inside the cabin, there's a single window that looks straight out towards the hog pasture, right where I was looking. I didn't say anything. I just came back in, sat down, grabbed the PlayStation controller, got ready to keep playing. And that's when my buddy laughed. He said, I'm getting a deer tomorrow. That fairy tale sucker is not going to stop me from getting a deer. He can come sit in a deer stand with me for all I care. And we just laughed. And see, I'm a lazy hunter. I'm as lazy as it comes. I do everything lazy, I'll admit it. I get up in the afternoon, I sleep in, and I romp around the woods. Sometimes I get something and sometimes I don't. My buddy, though, he's real gun ho He gets up before it gets daylight and he gets to his spot. And he makes sure, you know, that he's ready. So if anything walks by right there as the daylight's hitting, it's his. And he has harvested some beautiful deer throughout the years doing that. Now, his deer stand, to put into perspective, is right in the center of the field. And it is not your prototypical deer stand. It sits on the ground. There's a giant cedar tree that's right there in the middle of the field that he hollowed out. He cut the limbs off of it, put him a chair on the inside, and then put the limbs stacked back. So it looks almost natural. You'd never think if you walk by unless you're staring at it. And that was actually his stand for several years. Well, I'm asleep, and I get woken up to... Boom. 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 And I just sat straight up. I'm like, what is going on? What is he doing down there? And he was hunting with a 3030, which if you don't know, a 3030 is a lever action rifle where it's the old cowboy gun. You shoot it, you cock the lever, you shoot it, you cock the lever, ejects the shell, and you keep shooting. You can fire it pretty quick, but you know, you know, laws. You know, when you hunt deer, laws and stuff, you can only have a certain amount of shells in it. 
So he just had the he just had the legal three shells, you know, one in and then two in the magazine. So I'm like, what is he doing? Is he is he just that inaccurate? Is he is he sl- half asleep? Because he's real accurate with a gun. <laughs> I'm, I, I've been sitting in a stand with him. I've watched him hit some deer that, I mean, I couldn't have made a shot on. I'm a pretty good shot myself, I feel like. I couldn't have made some of them shots he's made. So I'm sitting there just like, what is he doing? And it didn't seem like no time. And he was just, he just basically kicked the door of that cabin in. And he said, Shadow, it's back. It crawled in the stand with me. Get your gun. You need to come see this. And I'm like, what is going on? And when he says, get your gun, we had at the time, we had a gun that he insisted we bring with us every time we went anywhere out there. It's kind of an ongoing gag, but he called it the werewolf be good gun. And it was my grandpa's 1972 Remington 870 long gun. I have T-Rex arms, so you should see me trying to carry this gun. And it shot a three and a half inch shell and I would load it buckshot slug, buckshot slug. And it had an eight round tube on it because the the weapon was so long. She could fit quite a few shells in it. And I'm already not in a good mood. I'm exhausted because I wanted to sleep later. I'm sitting there loading this gun on the way down. I'm dropping shells, picking them up, putting them back in the gun. I have no sense of urgency. So as I'm going, I said, what happened? He said, I was sitting there. I started hearing some rustling. And the next thing I know is I look down. I see its head in my lap. It's looking right up right at me, eye to eye. I panicked and I pulled the trigger on my gun. It took off. It ran. I chased it out of the tree stand. I shot at it twice. I think I might have hit it. I'm not sure. So the best thing I could think of is that he was sitting there and this thing got in behind the tree. This was a massive cedar tree and it crawled around. It came through and it just, I guess, got up there and it basically put its head in his lap and looked up. And uh, I, uh, I kind of woke up then. I'm like, well, maybe I need to stop fumbling around with these shells and get this gun loaded. Uh, because he wasn't lying. He was telling the truth. And when we get there, we're standing by the tree. And yeah, I said, you fired all three times, right? He said, yeah. So I think I hit it. He said, you think you hit it? He said, yes. And. As we're looking, he points to where it ran away, and it was like this perfect clearing. I'm talking maybe not even four or five foot wide clearing between two trees, a perfect little path. And I see a bullet shell. Well, not like the shell, but I see like a bullet hole where it hit the tree. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, he fires once in the air. So there's my first shell. He fires twice. He hits this tree. He fired a third time that we got a shell missing. Maybe he actually hit it. So I didn't see no bullet holes anywhere. So I'm standing by this clear, this clearing. I said, okay, you stand right here. I'm going to walk down a little bit. See if I see anything. Just be paying attention. Because you know as well as I know, this thing can take this gun from me and beat me with it. So... I cock the shotgun as a show of force and I pull the shotgun up and I'm walking this clearing, you know, and it's starting to get daylight now. So you kind of start seeing pretty good. And as I'm walking down, I don't get too far at all. I start seeing a blood trail. I'm like, well, okay, <laughs> that's pretty interesting. And I start tracking this blood trail and it gets thicker and it gets thicker. It gets thicker and it gets thicker. I'm like, holy smoke, he hit this thing. And I get to thinking to myself, because this blood trail gets thick. I'm talking thick, thick. And I'm like, one of the main things that bleeds on a body is the head or an artery. I'm like, he hit this thing in the head. 
I'm about to walk up and find this thing laying there dead. And what do I do? Who do we take pictures? Do we take pictures of it? Who do we call? Is the FBI going to come put us in a padded room? All this stuff is just going through my mind. But I don't find the body. I find something way scarier. As I get to the end of this blood trail, it just the blood trail stopped almost all at once. And I look down and kind of to the right, there is like a chunk of earth where earth had been mud had been just scooped up by a giant something. And then on the left side, there was a chunk of meat. And I picked this chunk of meat up and I looked in it. And sure as heck, it was the head of that 3030 shell. That thing, he hit it all right. I don't know where he hit it because you really couldn't tell by the little chunk of meat. But that thing was smart enough to know that it was hurt. It pulled the shell out, picked up mud, and then packed its wound, I'm guessing. And my buddy actually still has the shell. We never thought at that time to send it off to anything. He still hasn't sent it off. He keeps it, you know, he keeps it locked up in storage because, you know, it's, it's something it's something he'll tell his grandkids one day, whether they believe him or not. But that's kind of, that was the end of it. I walked back out there to him and we walked back up to the cabin. Needless to say, we did not get a deer. We went home and got Sonic. So. That was it. And then to my knowledge, you know, because I mean, we're, we're best friends. We do everything together. He maybe went out once a week to feed horses after that, you know, because they had horses and cows, but nothing ever, you know, he never found no bodies of nothing, anything like that. And I really didn't go back out there until 2020. That's kind of the end of it. Well, I can understand why you didn't go back until 2020. Yeah, that's a lot to deal with. When you had your first encounter, you said the dog man came out of the foliage and approached you from 15 feet away. How close did it get to you before stopping? It came because it walked out at 15 feet. And it just walked in a straight line to where it stopped and then just turned and stared. It never like walked toward us. It came from the left at 15 feet, stopped at 15 feet, looked at us at 15 feet, and then walked right back to the right side at 15 feet. So 15 feet would have been the closest it got to us that whole time. Except, obviously, when it got right there in his lap. Yeah, that's even worse. Way too close for comfort. Instead of being taken by its eyes, you said its ears made a bigger impression on you. Why was that? I'm still a little unsure about why that was. Because they just, they stuck up. They just stuck straight up. Kind of like a Doberman pincher, but I mean, I'm just talking just straight up ears that just stuck straight up. And they just, and they just, like I said, they twitched almost like it was like, kind of like it's radar. It was just sur- listening to everything around it. The ears, because they're just, you know, for the size of the head and stuff, the ears were just big pointy ears. They definitely stuck out. Yeah, they do have some big ears. I can understand why they made an impression on you. Did you ever see if it had a tail? It did not look like it had a tail. I mean, because as it turned and walked, I was still kind of looking up at its head. But from what I could tell, if it had a tail, it would have been maybe a bob, but it did not look like it had a tail. Well, no one can fault you for not knowing for sure about that. I'm sure you're just trying to hold it together. After having an experience like that, I mean, who wouldn't be having trouble holding it together? Do you have any regrets about leaving your friend there to cover your six while you ran back to the truck? You look back at it, and it should have been him that was running because he was more athletic. But I knew I looked in his eyes and I knew that that's what he wanted me to do. I mean, he was he was willing to lay down his life for me. And I'm glad that he didn't have to lay down his life for me. And I know that I would have made the same decision if anything else would have happened. That's why when. It came down to the end. I was the first one to go into the trail, the blood trail. I made sure I went first because he means the world to me, and I did not want anything to happen to him because he's been brave for me so many times. 
He's a good man for him to do that. Yeah, that says a lot about your friendship. You left your guns in the truck the day you guys had that first encounter. Did that mark the last time you've ever gone into the woods unarmed? <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Yeah, you, uh, we probably won't even walk the 15 feet from the truck to the cabin where we parked the truck without having a loaded weapon. You know, I mean, we have a respect for whatever's out there. And obviously, we don't want to hunt it anymore. The only time we would try to hurt something like this now, looking back, would be purely self-defense. But still, I mean, we're ready. You know, that's going to be something we, we don't go anywhere. I mean, I have the sidearm and I have at least a high-powered rifle for my shotgun. But like I said, we don't mean no matter. It didn't. It obviously could have hurt us and it didn't. And so obviously we wanted to hunt it that one night. But we changed our point of view pretty quick. And if anything like that ever happened again, the only way anybody, us or it, would get hurt would be self-defense. Well, it's admirable. I'm so glad to hear that you learned something from that experience. As long as you can say that, then, yeah, you know you're doing something right. Your friend shot that dog man with his 30 30. And like you said, it wound up pulling that bullet out of its body, packing mud into the wound, and seemingly it got away. Did you ever go back to that immediate area, risking running into that particular dogman again, knowing that it could very easily be holding a grudge against you? Well, we obviously didn't go to that area for a while. But, you know, one of our main deer spots is that area. But one of the conclusions that we kind of came to, and I mean, I know we're kind of, we're still dumb kids, but one thing we kind of thought of together is we don't think that it was there permanently. We think it was just kind of passing through because I can definitely see it carrying a grudge on us. That's kind of why we didn't go back for a little bit. I mean, he went back almost two weeks later, so that's why I definitely don't think that it was there to stay. I think that it was passing through. I think it was curious, and I think that it was, you know, it was probably long gone within two or three days. But the thought did cross my mind of going back down there to kind of maybe look for hair and stuff the very next day. But we decided that it was best to just stay away for a little bit, especially because he made contact, you know, with it. You know, when it, he definitely didn't kill it unless it maybe got an infection or something and went and laid down somewhere. But you know, they say, you know, you don't want to anger a cornered predator. And I promise if you shoot something like that, it's angered. It's angered good. So you want to stay away for a little bit and give it just enough time to cool down. And that's what we were doing. Well, dogmen do hold grudges like it's <laughs> going out of style. So I'm so glad to hear that even though you went back there, you guys came out in one piece. Thank goodness for that. When you met your friends out there to go look for that dog man, it was already getting dark, you said. Now you do, but didn't you see any problem with you guys doing that back then? <laughs> no, we uh, we thought that, you know, we got these lights, we got this Can-Am, we got these big guns. We're four decently strong men. We've hunted everything there is all over Oklahoma. This is just one more bigger creature to hunt. We've hunted, you know, coyotes at night. We've hunted hogs at night. We weren't thinking things through because, like I said, once the fear of that daytime encounter left, the adrenaline started going, and we thought we were invincible. Turns out we were just stupid. Well, you know it is. When you're that young, you think you are invincible. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone can hold that against you. You didn't warn your friends you called out there about why you asked them to come out there in the first place until they showed up. Did any of those guys take you to task about doing that later on? No. <sighs> Believe it or not, they didn't. They, uh, they, you know, because they were, they were thankful that when we got, they got out there that we were open with them. We were honest with them. And obviously, if we didn't see anything, no one got hurt. But uh, like I said, the one, the big hunter, he was pretty upset. He wanted the he wanted the chance at it. I mean, he you could just I don't know if I've had some talks with him since then. And he kind of keeps some stuff hidden, and I don't know. I have maybe the feeling that maybe he might have had a pretty scary encounter with one that was scarier than mine, because the second I said werewolf, he just snapped to attention and started listening, and. 
the whole time we were in that can am i mean he was just zoned in i mean he had his light focus he was staring he was knowing he knew where to look you know because he you know these things something like that it's going to be athletic it's going to be in treetops it's going to be moving quickly on the ground he was looking in treetops he was honed in and he'll tell you to this day he said i I wish i could have saw it i mean he's probably one of the few of us that like he had he has a i feel like he has a grudge against him i don't know if something happened to him because me and him are real good friends but like i said he just he keeps his secrets i don't know if something happened to him but i mean he knew where to look i think he knew it was a dog you know because i didn't learn about dog men until roughly 2020 I think he knew exactly what dog men were. I think he knew what they were capable of. And I think maybe he's tried to hunt one before. Maybe he had a bad incident. I don't know. But it just, he just had that vibe about him that he knew what was going on. My other buddy, like I said, you know, he was just kind of there. He was there for support. You know, and like I said, he didn't, no one held no grudges that we tried to skip, you know, we tried to trick them out there because we really didn't trick them. We told them the truth as soon as they got there. And thank God. None of us were hurt. But like I said, the hunter, he was, something was with him. He knew something. It sounds like he just might have had an experience with one that he didn't tell you about. Yeah, it does make you wonder. You said that your first encounter scared you to death. If that was so, why'd you guys go back out that November? Because, you know, it's deer season. Deer season has always been a really good time for us. Deer season brings back a lot of good memories. You know, you go out there, you play cards, you play video games, you have a good time. And and I kind of even told him before we went, you know, I said, hey, man, I'm a little nervous about this. And he even said, oh, man, whatever that was is gone. We, I mean, we went back out there with the impression that it was gone. Because after we saw it that first day, like I said, he probably went out once a week after about a two-week period, you know, to feed cattle and feed horses you know, and ride around and stuff. And he, you know, he never saw anything. So we went back out there with the impression that it was gone. That's why I went back so quick. But after that happened, that's why I kind of took the two year hiatus because I knew that even if it was gone, something else might be coming through. And I just wanted time to kind of think about everything. And uh, I still, you know, to this day, I applaud my buddy for going out there. Now, during that two year hiatus, I went in other woods and I deer hunted, you know, and I even went with him to other places, but it took a little bit for me to be able to go back to Jack Fort. Well, I can understand why. Yeah. I'm surprised it only took you two years to get over that first encounter. Your friend said that the dog man got into the stand with them. How big was that stand inside though? Well, Vic, as I said, his stand, it was basically just a chair on the ground with tree limbs stacked in front of him. So it had pretty good, because he cut it out. He probably had it cut out maybe seven by seven. So it was pretty roomy in there. So that thing was able to just kind of crawl through the limbs and come right there to him. Now we don't sit on the ground. We sit in a tree and we also do not hunt alone. We sit in a real nice, heavy two man stand and a nice giant tree. Yeah, if you're going to hunt like that, and especially if you know dogmen around, yeah, there's nothing like being way up off the ground, so I don't blame you for doing that. When it came into the stand with him that day, did he get the impression that it knew he was there, or do you think that was just happenstance? I mean, looking back at it, we've kind of talked about it, and I mean, it. we think that it was just curious. We think it was young and curious, and it smelled him, you know, because he has a real, real bad habit. He loves to carry beef jerky in his jacket pocket when he hunts because he's a snacker. He will snack all the time. He will carry jerky, pop tarts, all that stuff. And I, I have a feeling. I never asked him, but I have a feeling that his stick of beef jerky was probably open, had a couple nibbles off of it, and that thing smelt it, and was just investigating. I wonder what he would have done if it would have reached up and grabbed a stick of that beef jerky and pulled it out of his pocket. <laughs> oh, man. He probably would have gladly let it have it. <laughs> <laughs> he probably would have dumped the tank, too, in his pants, but I can't oh, say I blame him. Oh, boy. 
If you would have done that, though, that's what spray and wash is for, so no big deal. <laughs> you said it was eye to eye with him inside that stand. You said it was practically in his lap. Did it ever touch him? Yeah, it, uh, it basically came right up. So to kind of paint a picture from what he told me, picture you're sitting in a chair and you're kind of looking out. And one of you, you say you have like a small, even though this thing ain't small, picture you just have a small kid, you know, that runs around your house and the kid comes up, you know, and like, you know, basically comes right up to your knees, kind of leans on you and looks up, you know, hey, daddy, what are you doing? You know, daddy, can I have this? Daddy, can I have that? You know, basically just comes right up to you, leans on you and looks up. But this thing was so big, the way he describes it is basically its body was almost still on the ground. It was kind of half up, kind of pushing up kind of arching its back up off the ground with its, you know, its, its arms kind of like in a push up position while still laying on the ground. It's kind of looked up, but it's kind of a little bit of weight on his knees and its head kind of up in his lap. The head wasn't touching him though, but its upper body was touching his knees and the head was just kind of cocked looking up at him. Yeah. That would have caused a lot of people to have to be committed. <laughs> he, uh, he probably should have been committed when we were kids. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a different story, though. After experiencing that dog man coming into the stand with him like that, how strongly did it affect him? Well, you can usually time shots, and their cabin is roughly a mile and a half from his stand. And athletic people do a mile and a half in what? You, I don't know what the average is, but mine's slow. But an athletic person can do a mile and a half in 12, 12 minutes. And I timed it, you know, you could, you know, cause I kind of looked at my watch when I heard all that to see what time it was. And that happened right there at daylight, right there about six in the morning ish. And he was back at the cabin. I promise in no less than 10 minutes. I mean, he took off as fast as he could after he shot that thing or shot at it. Obviously he hit it, but, uh, like I said, he came barged in there, and he's like I said, he's he's very calm demeanor. I mean, he's a teacher now. That's his profession. He teaches. He's good at talking and being professional. But I mean, he busted in that cabin, talking ninety miles an hour like I normally would, and just saying, "Get the gun, get the gun, it's back." It it touched me, you know. I mean, he was belligerent for a little bit, and even on the way back down, as like I said, as I was loading the gun and fumbling my shells and not paying any attention to anything, because I still have sleep. He was still just, hey, this is what's going on. This is what's going on. This is what's going on, you know. So it 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 kind of did a number on him, but you know, he recovered decently quick. Well, thank goodness for that. And it sounds like he was motivated to get back into the cabin, but <laughs> I can't say I'll blame him. Yeah, that's rough. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Shadow. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Um. One thing I'd like to say is I really appreciate you, Vic. I really appreciate what you do for people like me. I have told this story to less than 20 people because people think you're crazy. And one of the comment I can make is, you know, one thing I always believe about dog man is, you know, millions of hunters all over the United States go out in the woods every year. And you can only imagine the stuff they see that they'll never speak. Because they're just, you know, because like me, I mean, I work in corrections, you know, I ain't going to go around telling that story too much. I mean, people are going to think you're crazy. So I appreciate people like you that believe in people like me. Well, you know, you're welcome. I wouldn't have it any other way. I feel so blessed, so lucky to be in the position to talk with all these dogmen eyewitnesses. So, no, it's a pleasure. But having said that, thanks again so much for coming on and sharing all the details of those experiences with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Vic. Well, you know you're welcome. Thanks again so much. Have a great night.